and the slides are okay now yeah it's in full screen okay all right so um, although the topic is thyroid sonocrinology i think you know as a clinician most of us uh, in the audience would like to know you know a clinical approach and a practical approach to thyroid module so this kind of will be in uh, the ultrasound aspects predominantly the ultrasound aspects of course we will add on certain aspects of clinical and um, uh, investigative techniques that we also use uh, in the evaluation so that's uh, that will also be over into the stock um, first and foremost, I think we all agree, and uh, as an endocrinologist, this has become a serious problem. I mean, everybody is getting imaging these days, whether it is a Doppler of the neck, whether it is a CT scan of the neck and chest, whether it is a PET scan uh, for uh, whatever it is, you are going to encounter thyroid nodules. And 60% is the uh, rough you know, prevalence rate, and, and the simple rule to remember is, it is almost the same, the prevalence of thyroid nodules is almost the same as the decade the patient's age is in. Suppose patients, a patient is about 60 years old, there's about a 50% you know, a, a chance that you will find a thyroid nodule. So almost a decade is almost the equivalence of the prevalence rate of thyroid nodules. So it's quite a prevalent scenario. And we are going to see patients who are going to come in with this problem, bringing their reports, radiology reports uh, with the nodule to ask us what to do about it. The goal of evaluating a thyroid nodule is only you know, two important things. One is to we need to exclude cancer, and that's of course the primary reason why patients come with the fear that it might be cancer. The second, also equally important goal is not to do things which is going to cause harm. So primum non nocere is an important element that we keep in mind, and we you know, use this philosophy as we go across nodule evaluation. And last, and you know, but not the least. Common sense sometimes also plays an important. Sometimes we get too much guided into guidelines, uh, algorithms, and sometimes forget that you know what brought the patient to me, and and that sometimes very important. Sometimes go back and review the history and you know what what is the reason why this was done, and sometimes that may be very critical to know how do we go forward. And I also will take this platform to also you know emphasize that thyroid surgery is not a simple surgery which will not have any long lasting effect we have had enough patients who after total thyroid surgery total thyroidectomy are not the same again we go and ask patients and, and you know we don't have solid quality of life data from india but from abroad from israel as well as from the europe there are definitive evidence that patients who have undergone total thyroidectomy have morbidities that extend beyond just the nerve palsy or calcium problems i mean you know that, that those two entities are much over with a very high volume surgeon. But even with a high volume surgeon, there are issues which are related to quality of life, which patients you know voice out to us and tell us that, sir, you know what, I am never the same person. My I am a little bit more tired now. I need despite this being they are on you know supra maximal you know uh, replacement sometimes or even good dose of thyroxine, they never get to the same level. At, at what they started off before surgery. So it's very important that before we put somebody under the knife, it's also important to guide them correctly whether they need the surgery or not. I will just quickly go over three clinical scenarios that we commonly encounter and tell you the importance of why thyroid sonology ultrasonography becomes very important. This is a 25-year-old female underwent a neck ultrasound because of pain in her neck. And the physician examined her and orders an ultrasound of the neck. Ultrasound showed a nodule, two and two centimeters, and then they have reported it as neoplastic nodule. It is very common to see ultrasound report which is not following either the ATA risk stratification or the thyroid scoring. And a biopsy is recommended. And a biopsy of that shows a few follicular cells, some colloid and a few cyst macrophages. And then this is reported as a likely colloid goiter. Again, FNAC not reporting and the standard platform of Bethesda reporting is done. And, apps, and, and they will always give a disclaimer, kind of saying an excision biopsy is recommended to confirm the diagnosis. Once you see that report, the physician will send them to a surgeon. A surgeon who, who is not, who does not do thyroid surgeries every every week or every few surgeries a month, but somebody who does very low volume surgery, and then unfortunately this lady undergoes a total thyroid surgery and becomes hypocalcemic, probably even has a vocal cord palsy. And the final pathology comes back as an adenomatoid nodule. Did she really have to undergo uh, a significant surgery 
for something which is benign. So this is a question that com comes back and haunts us many times when an unnecessary surgery gets done. Just because a proper triaging of ultrasound, a proper triaging of FNAC data was not done. Second clinical scenario is the reverse of that. A person, a 45-year-old male, comes with cough and hemoptysis. CT of the neck and chest showed a thyroid nodule. Ultrasound reported a thyroid nodule and reported it as a well-defined nodule with a halo, likely a benign. Again, not giving you a risk stratification, but just giving you a descriptive appearance. FNAC is showing Hertel cells and some atypical cells. The moment they saw Hertel cells, they underwent a total thyroidectomy and pathology came back as Hertel cell cancer. He was referred for a radioactive iodine scan. Iodine scan showed uptake in the central and lateral neck. And when the radio iodine physician said there is lymph nodes in the neck, then an ultrasound of the neck is done. That time it shows bilateral metastatic lymph nodes, which is very common with Hertel cell cancers. And now the patient is told you need a resurgery for the neck before undergoing a radioactive iodine therapy. And this is again a very, not a very uncommon scenario. Once in two or three months, we get these kind of patients whom a proper pre-operative ultrasound mapping or an ultrasound, uh, dedicated ultrasound before surgery was not done and thereby unnecessary repeat surgery is required. So in the first case, you saw how surgery was a, a kill or an overkill. And second case, you see where surgery was not adequately performed it was an under underperformance because a, a, a proper scan was not done. The third scenario is also where again, uh, where we, uh, we, we see this not too often, 24 year old female presenting with a large nodule on the right lobe, a bind FNAC is done by pathology lab, reported as colloid fluid, no cells. That's very important when the pathologists have not seen any cells and only seen a fluid and reporting it as a benign colloid cyst is rather tricky because you have not seen any follicular cells and then they're asked to do it back in a year, it comes back with an increase in size of the lesion and a hoarse voice, probably because of compression of the recurrent lesion nerve. Ultrasound showed a large cystic nodule, but neural ma mass with microcalcifications and infiltration to the recurrent lesion nerve. So ultrasound guided FNAC in this case showed a betagistic cycle. So telling us that a blind FNAC is to be replaced with an ultrasound guided FNAC, particularly in nodules that cystic to, uh, to target these solid areas. What is lacking in a thyroid nodule evaluation that we have seen time and time again? a careful history and physical examination. Again, the, I, I, although my talk is on sonography, I will again re-emphasize that history and physical examination are always number one. Never forget why the patient came to you. Never forget to lay your hands on the patient's neck to examine the gland. A dedicated neck sonographer, it's very important that one of them takes up this lead of doing this neck sonography in a very dedicated way. It's not just an, another ultrasound, but it's a dedicated neck ultrasound. And you also would like to have a, a good cytopathologist who has special interest in thyroid cytology, who you regularly interact with. That's very, very important. Of course, having a high volume thyroid surgeon is a blessing. If you have one, that's very good. Otherwise, find out who is a good surgeon before you refer your patient for the surgery. And last but not the least, why are we involved in this as physicians? We form an important bridge. We connect the dots because we are the one who have examined the patient. We are the one who have taken a detailed history, we review the ultrasound report or sometimes even do the ultrasound by ourselves and then we talk to the pathologist and then finally we are in touch base with the surgeon to ensure that the correct thing is done for the patient. So we form an important bridge connecting the dots here and that's why our understanding of this problem is extremely important. Before I go to the sonographic uh, details of the thyroid nodules, I will again re-emphasize that the need for history, age, male gender, rapid growth of mass, force voice dysphagia, solid, solitary nodules, more than four centimeter lesions, particularly when there are large ones, look for Pemberton sign, fixity of the mass, not moving with degradation, palpable lymph nodes, particularly in the level three, level four, the lymph nodes below your tricot cartilage becomes level three, level four, palpable nodes in that regard becomes very important when you're dealing with thyroid nodules. History of childhood head and neck radiation, particularly for bone marrow transplantation, whole body radiation, Family history of thyroid cancer, particularly relevant in case of non medullary thyroid cancers, also are important in the form of uh, FAP syndrome or Cowden syndrome. This is a classic example where, you know, there was a patient who came in, nobody asked him to remove his shirt, and when he removed his shirt, you could see dilated chest veins. And you know that there was an SVC obstruction. This patient had a medullary thyroid cancer with large lymph nodes blocking the thoracic, uh, you know, thoracic inlet. Again, here you see a large mass causing vocal cord palsy, pulling of saliva. Here, I'm, uh, you know, I'm sure the audience can appreciate 
there is a right side ptosis and uh, as well as meiosis Horner syndrome caused by a large thyroid problem. So these clinical clues are important. Please pay attention to these because if you find them, they supersede any kind of uh, triaging system, what an ultrasound or uh, the, the test cytology will give you because these are very hard for clinical points which tell you that the lesion is likely to be malignant. Again, a classic lady which showing Pemberton sign. It's very commonly reported in the in the, uh, the Western literature. But when you look carefully, you see that the ruddy, ruddy complexion of the face comes prominent. The facial way, the, the veins over the forehead also become prominent. The lips start to become a little bit more cyanotic when you ask them to lift the hand. So the, important to recognize these uh, you know equivalent signs in the dark skinned Indian complexion as well. After you finish the history and examination comes the ultrasound. You don't need any sophisticated high-tech uh, gadget. You, all you need is a simple tabletop ultrasound, which portable ones are equally good enough. I have been using a portable ultrasound in my, uh, in my practice for the last uh, three to four years. And now, uh, fortunately, the hospital has been uh, kind enough to give me a little bigger machine. And all you need is a high-frequency flat probe. The one that I'm showing you is not a flat probe. You need a flat probe with a frequency that's about 4 megahertz to 12 megahertz or 4 to 11 megahertz, uh, a flat um, uh, linear probe. Uh, the setting that you will want to choose in your ultrasound machine is these small parts, ultrasound of the small parts. Some of the newer machines already have thyroid and lymph nodes incorporated in the setting, so you can choose that. So you don't want to go into the you know the, the ones that scan the abdomen or the ones that scan the uh, the uh, the the carotids. You have a very specific the small parts ultrasound, which is very useful when we do the ultrasound of the thyroid. The basic landmark of when you put the probe transversely, transversely meaning over the neck uh, in the, in the, in the in the same uh, parallel to the neck. You will see the following structures from top to bottom. This is the top or uh, top end of the patient. This is the bottom end, the anterior most aspect, the skin subcutaneous tissue. It may be very prominent in some people who have a lot of fat here, but in thin people, you will not find uh, much uh, much in, uh, intervening tissue. You have the strap muscles, the uh, the the first the, the 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 dark colored or what you call as deep black color uh, strap muscles coming up uh, below the subcutaneous tissue. On the slightly more lateral aspect, you will find the sternocleidomastoid. mastoid. So the strap muscles, sternocleidomastoid, mastoid, and then on either side of the thyroid lobes, you will have the big vessels, the carotid, the jugular on either sides. And in within encompassing within this, it will be your midline trachea. And trachea, because it contains air, will not be reflecting uh, uh, the uh, the uh, the sound wave, and hence you will have a dark. Uh, appearance here and on either end of the trachea you will have the thyroid lobe which is a triangle shaped lobe connected in between by the isthmus now on the left side it's important to keep in mind that he, in the junction just between the trachea and the lobe you will find esophagus esophagus can be easily identified if you ask the patient to swallow you will find uh, particles which will move and create a sort of a jingle appearance that you can easily identify the esophagus Posterior to the esophagus, on either sides, you will find again a muscle kind of a picture, dark black, which is called the longus coli or the prevertebral muscles. So these are your basic landmarks. Whenever you put the uh, probe on the patient's neck, you will be able to identify. You, you can identify these basic structures in most patients who have not had any surgery in the past, and provided they they uh, you know there has not been any kind of interventions done in the past. So this. Identification of normal structures are very important. The more and more frequently you do the ultrasound, the more and more easier it becomes for you to identify these structures. Now, when we come to thyroid nodule evaluation, um, this is the, the, the ACR thyroid scoring that the American College of Radiology recommend using. And I think uh, from previous reports, the ACR thyroid kind of supersedes the other a thyroid's uh, reporting system just because its ability to pick up benign nodules is very useful, prevents in unnecessary surgeries. So there are certain aspects of thyroid nodules that you want to look at. You want to look at the composition of the, of the nodule. You want to look at the echogenicity of the nodule. You want to look at the shape. You want to look at margins and look on the echogenic foci. So I want to go and show you each and every single aspect and give you some examples of how these uh, how these things play out when you look at a particular thyroid nodule. 
and each of it has a scoring system and based on the scoring you will be able to finally classify them as tr1 tr5 one being benign two being not suspicious three and four being mild to moderate suspicious and five being highly suspicious again this tr scoring is important because you're going to then decide whom to buy fna whom to follow and whom not to fna so that, that's also very important when you know these uh, five important aspects of a nodule evaluation so my talk from here on is going to focus on nodule evaluation using these five important elements uh, if you want later on if we have time i will show you diffuse thyroid problems like thyroiditis and other aspects as well but here today i will focus on nodule evaluation specifically the first part is composition what does a nodule contain is it contain fluid is it solid is it a mixed fluid and solid so if it's completely cystic then you you almost zero points spongy form spongy form basically means micro cysts zero points mixed cystic solid one point solid or completely solid two points so this is a example on the right side you see a completely cystic nodule now how do you know if this is a cyst can this be a very darkly hypoechoic nodule that's a frequent question that comes up whenever we look at a cyst one important two and i i'm hoping i can show you in the next couple of uh, i have some examples here so there is something called as post um, uh, you know posterior acoustic shadowing whenever you see a cyst the fluid in the, the fluid in the nodule will allow all the ultrasound waves to freely pass through as i told you air does not allow it to pass bone does not allow it to pass but the fluid in the cyst will allow all the waves to pass through so the area behind the cyst will always be a little bit more brighter so the echogenicity will be more white so you can see that post uh, posterior aspect of the cyst will be hyperechoic and this enhancement that you see post acoustic enhancement is a clue that this contains only fluid and not a very dark appearing solid so that's an important clue for why this is a cystic nodule this example is a solid nodule so solid means there is no cystic component is predominantly solid now when i say solid we'll come to echogenicity there are two kinds of solid you can have uh, iso or hyperechoic solid or you can have hypoechoic solid we'll come to that in the next but first as soon as you see a nodule you want want to know solid or cystic remember that even a solid nodule sometimes can have cystic change here is a solid nodule but having a cystic change in the center as well and here is again a solid nodule having a cystic change and look at the uh, look at the post acoustic enhancement this post acoustic enhancement is a very classical uh, description that the nodule predominantly contains easily transmissible liquid items so that's important that well and when you have a post acoustic enhancement it's a very reassuring sign that nodule contains more of a, a liquid uh, entity which is predominantly a liquid uh, a cystic nodule uh, again here you will see a cystic nodule here a solid with some cystic areas here is also a solid nodule with cystic areas but uh, again you can you will still have post acoustic enhancement seen as well now again uh you can also have solid cystic nodules but a small caveat there whenever you have a solid and a cystic nodule you describe the ultrasound features of the solid area you describe the ultrasound features of the solid area that's very very important and here you can see that the nodule here uh is is is, is again um, uh, a, a nodule with a lot of small small pockets of fluid you can see the small small pockets of fluid this we call as a spongy form appearance when you have micro cystic appearance each and every cyst there will create a post acoustic enhancement and so you will see a small cyst and a little linear white line behind it so a small cyst with a linear bright line behind it multiple of them there will create what we call as spongy form appearance it's called as a spongy form nodule so this is a cystic solid nodule but the mural solid nodule is more spongy form appearance and another important clue uh, which i will also show you in a few, few slides is the angle in which the mural nodule will join the main cyst uh, here see the nodule is a little bit more solid here it doesn't have any microcystic appearance and if people can appreciate on the screen there are a few solid punctate hyperechogenic foci that are also seen so this makes this solid nodule a little bit more suspicious than the one on your on your left so this is a solid cystic nodule when you have solid and cystic nodule you describe the ultrasound characteristics of the solid area of the nodule this i told you spongy form nodule spongy form so you have solid you have cystic nodule you have solid nodule you have solid cystic nodules and when a nodule is composed of micro cyst 
each cyst forming linear post acoustic enhancement that is called a bag of multiple spongiform cysts we call them spongiform nodules a spongiform nodules almost always implies it is a benign nodule it's usually a tyrash 2 nodule so this is an important element this is an important pattern to recognize because they don't come under your solid nodule or cystic nodule the moment you find that the nodule looks spongiform automatically you complete your triaging it becomes a tr2 nodule so that is the content what it is contains second aspect is the echogenicity is it anechoic a cyst hyperechoic or isoechoic one so it's really not important whether it is hyperechoic or isoechoic because the point system is going to be one so don't have to worry too much whether it is isoechoic or hyperechoic but hypoechoic becomes important and very hyperechoic or deeply hyperechoic becomes even more important i'll show you some examples this is a hyperechoic look at the remaining thyroid gland the remaining thyroid gland is a little dull gray whereas a nodule per se is bright it's shining out that's called a hyperechoic nodule hyperechoic nodule in the setting of a dull gland usually indicates a white night sign a very classical clue of hashimoto thyroid nodule usually a benign nodule you need to fn these nodules so hyperechoic nodules are brighter than the remaining thyroid gland whereas sometimes the nodule is equal echogenicity to the thyroid gland we call the isoechoic now you really don't have to break your head about whether it is hyperechoic or isoechoic because the point structure is just one point so you don't have to worry too much about if you're not able to distinguish the two but it is good to know hyperechoic nodules generally are a favorable sign in terms of the nodule uh, uh, sonographic features again see here iso hyperechoic so here the remaining thyroid parenchyma and here is a little hyperechoic nodule here the nodule is almost the same as the remaining thyroid parenchyma sometimes if the thyroid parenchyma is already altered by means of a autoimmune disease you may not have a normal thyroid parenchyma to compare you may have you may have to use your salivary glands to compare the echogenicity but again being a little too far we don't need that kind of a nuance here compare the thyroid parenchyma thyroid parenchyma the thyroid nodule looks dull is it is it is it bright is it same as the thyroid parenchyma if it's same as parenchyma it's iso if it is brighter it's hyper and if it is duller then we call hypoechoic because this thyroid nodule compared to the thyroid parenchyma this nodule is definitely dull or but darker in appearance so it is hypoechoic whereas here you see the thyroid nodule is equal to the remaining parenchyma or maybe a little brighter we call it either high sort hyperechoic thyroid nodule the the key nodule feature that you want to appreciate is what is called markedly hypoechoic when the nodules color is equal to that of your sternocleidomastoid or your strap muscles remember i showed you i just quickly go back to that sternocleidomastoid and look at that look at that echogenicity of the strap muscles and the sternocleidomastoid this is darkly hypoechoic or deeply hypoechoic whenever your thyroid nodule is as darkly hypoechoic as your muscle then we call that markedly hypoechoic a markedly hypoechoic nodule has a strong uh, uh, suspicion for thyroid cancer that's very important so we finished the content we finished the echogenicity then we go to the shape how is the shape now when you look at the shape you want to keep the probe on the transverse plane you should not keep it vertically on the neck it has to be horizontal on the neck that's how you do do this criteria you measure two important length you measure the transverse length and the antero posterior length whenever the thyroid nodule is growing along the plane of the no lobe so it grows wider rather than becoming more and more taller then we call this more benign feature you don't give any score for that zero points on the other hand if the nodule becomes more taller which means the antero posterior dimensions are wider and wider rather than the transverse dimension then we call that Taller than wider. Taller than wider is a very specific sign for thyroid cancer. So if you find taller than wider, then you give it three points. That that by increasing your risk of it being a malignant nodule. Keep in note that this is applicable only to a single nodule. When you have multiple nodules in a kind of a lobulated appearance, sometimes that may mimic a taller than wider nodule. That is not to be included. If you have to have a single nodule, this sign holds how it's true. Look at here again. A wider than taller. nodule growing more on the transverse plane whereas here this nodule clearly showing a more taller than wider appearance so we finished the shape and then coming to the margins margins can be smooth can be ill defined remember ill defined is not equivalent to irregular ill defined means you can't see well 
irregularities you can see it and it sort of you know having a little finger like projections or making a little wavy margin lobulation i'll show you some examples and clearly if you see extra thyroid extension those are bad signs and gives you more points so here you see a well uniform margin very nice margin so so uniform when you have a uniform margin doesn't matter what the echogenicity is here this is a isoechoic nodule or a, maybe a hyperechoic nodule this is hypoechoic and this is markedly hypoechoic so these are all three nodules are different echogenicity but they are they are all having a regular or a smooth margin so you get only zero points for this so they don't increase your point structure sometimes you have spongy form nodules here is a spongy form nodule or you have a cystic solid nodule here you can see the margins very clearly and then on the sides here you have lost the margin you really cannot see where the margins are here so that becomes a really defined margin here again a spongy form nodule margins are a little blurred so when there is a blurred margin particularly common with spongy form nodules again you don't give any point for that again any defined margin because the cystic nodule again because of a blurred margin sometimes you have to put the vascular flow to see where the margins are and then you delineate the margin so if you have an ill defined margin it doesn't give you any weightage but when you have a lobulated margin i put this picture again and again because it's so classic appearance of a lobulation if you have a outpouching that is seen from the main thyroid nodule that's a classic lobulated margin this gets you a higher score uh, of two points for the margins again this is an example of extra thyroid extension see the thyroid nodule here it's got a lobulation in the posterior aspect on the anterior aspect it's almost pushing through the thyroid the capsule the, the white line that you see here the white dark hyper intense white line is kind of breached here and you can see the thyroid going nodule going beyond the capsule is a classic extension of a extra it's classic description of an extra thyroid extension that you can see so graphically as well and this is a classic example of malignant thyroid nodules again see infiltrative borders infiltrative or irregular borders when you have multiple wavy or finger like projections that's an infiltrative border here isthmic nodule again infiltrating beyond the white line the hyper intense white line that you see bordering the thyroid that capsule is gone and it's almost going into the subcutaneous tissue that's an important infiltrative margin here you can see a nice little lobulation here and here you can see a little finger like projection and a little lobulation here see these are all very important if you find them they are very very specific for thyroid cancers this is a vascular invasion look at this here this is a thyroid cancer nodule this is a carotid and this is a internal jugular vein when i just move the probe a little bit the nodule is almost extending into the internal jugular vein when you put the vascular flow you can see the carotid is well filled with blood flow whereas the vein is not filled with any blood circulation because there is a tumor thrombus sitting inside it and so this is a classic example and when you find these kind of clear cut overt examples of extra thyroid extension you don't need any more conclusive proof that this is cancer or not last but not the least are echogenic foci and this sometimes can be tricky even to people who have been doing ultrasound for a long time because they can mimic each other so you have what is called large comet tails zero points macro calcifications one point macro meaning bigger than 1 cm a uh, bigger than uh, and usually it will cast a shadow bigger than 1 mm they will cast a shadow peripheral rim calcifications two points and punctate echogenic foci we use of word pef punctate echogenic foci three points we don't use the word micro calcification here keep in mind micro calcification is uh, is 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 been changed with punctate echogenic foci the reason is the large comet tail which is more than 1 mm usually is a, a, a indication of benignity whereas when you have punctate echogenic foci you can either have a micro calcification or you can have small comet tails small comet tails will also look like a little white dot you cannot really distinguish whether it is a small comet tail or it is a punctate echogenic foci so uh, or it is a micro calcification so you put them together into punctate echogenic foci pf means you're getting it three points it's also a very specific sign so you got to keep this in mind macro calcification is the one which cast shadow i'll show you some example and rim calcification is the one which is outside the thyroid nodule so here is large comet tail we uh, the the sh the size of the the shadow itself is about more than 1 mm and they have a bright foci and then you have a little reverberation call artifact right behind it so this is a reverberation artifact this is because the ultrasound waves hit on these colloid particles and get river there's, there's an artifact created because of the vibration these particles vibrate with the sound waves and therefore you get a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a shadow the classic example of comet tail artifact if you want to look 
is actually trachea. If you look at the place of probe of trachea, you will see a lot of column uh, reverberation artifact. That's a classic example of a large comet tail. So we have a, a, a dense particle and then a little column with of, of, uh, of fine white lines. That's a large comet tail, usually more than one millimeter. If you have a large comet tail, very reassuring sign that this is a, likely to be a colloid particle or a colloid nodule. See again here, you have a large common tail, you have a nice little tail that is seen, a common tail with a little tail, but sometimes you may have small common tails. You have very small, it's not more than one millimeter, so it's just a little small thing. Uh, a small common tail can also be seen. You have to be careful because small common tails can sometimes mimic or micro calcifications sometimes can mimic small common tails. So we bunch them together. If you have small common tails, you can't be as confident as a large common tail. Uh, and so we bunch them together as punctate echogenic foci. What about macro calcifications? Whenever you have calcifications that give you a post acoustic shadowing, that means that the calcium or the you know, hard calcium is not allowing the sort of ultrasound waves to pass through. So you have a, a shadow here. It's nothing that is seen here. So a, a dense shadow that is seen, a dark shadow that is seen is called a post echogenic, uh, echogenic shadowing. If you have shadowing like this, you call this a macro calcification. So you have, they're usually more than one millimeter. You look for a posterior signal dropout. There's no signal here. Coarse calcifications are common in lymphocyte thyroiditis, degenerative thyroiditis, multinodular goiters. One rare occasion where you have to be careful about coarse calcification is when they appear in large, chunky calcifications. When you have large, chunky calcifications, that can be a sign of medullary thyroid cancer. One has to be careful before just discarding them as just a dystrophic calcification. When you have micro calcification, here you see a, a punctate echogenic foci, not casting a shadow, and then you have a, 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 cal a calcium spec that is casting a shadow. When the macro calcification occurs in the presence of micro calcification, then it loses the quality of benignity. It becomes equally important as a malignant marker. We call about rim calcification when the entire nodule is becoming filled with the rim, that's called rim calcification. One has to be careful with rim calcification because there may be areas of rim calcification that the nodule can outpouch into. So when you have an incomplete or an irregular or an ill-formed Ill rim calcification, that you know carries weightage and your tyrides will give you a support for that. So here you have a complete uh, uh, regular actual calcification. You are not able to see the posterior aspect because of the dense calcification in the anterior aspect. So this is a complete actual calcification. It's usually a benign calcification. Whereas if you have an interrupted actual uh, calcification and the rim is calcified partly, but then there is partly this interruption, that usually indicates that there may be some amount of extra parodal, ex extra capsular extension of the tumor. So interrupted calcifications or rim calcifications are a little bit more sinister than a complete regular eggshell calcification. That's important. Last but not the least is the punctate echogenic foci, white specks that you see in a nodule. See here, the nodule is uh, relatively hypoechoic and you have dense echogenic foci. And that's important. Again, lobulated margins, echogenic foci. Again, infiltrative margins and uh, hypoechoic nodule with, uh, with uh, echogenic foci. Multiple bright, usually less than one millimeter, they do not, they do not cause shadowing. They are usually seen in a hypoechoic nodule. It's an important caveat. Usually you will see these bright specks and they are visualized better on a hypoechoic nodule. You don't find these microcalcifications of punctate echogenic foci in a hyperechoic nodule, uh, just because they are uncommon to occur that way. But you can have, but in general, in general, these punctate echogenic foci will be seen in a hypoechoic, particularly a deeply hypoechoic nodule. As I told you, comet tail artifacts sometimes can mimic a, 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 a punctate echogenic foci. So this is a punctate echogenic foci, and this is a comet tail artifact. If you find a nice tail like this, it's good. But sometimes you may not find these tails, and they, you may be confused with uh, a microcalcification. So that's why it's important to just keep them as PEF for now, and then evaluate based on the other findings. That's a classic punctate echogenic foci. There's no shadowing behind. So it's not a calcium macro calcification. Again, here you have very de well defined echogenic foci and don't have any kind of common tail appearance in the posterior aspect. I told you that micro calcifications or punctate echogenic foci typically occurs in a hypoechoic nodule. This is a case where 
it is an isoechoic nodule and still you can find echogenic foci punctate echogenic foci here, here here you also have a macro calcification there so you can also have it in the setting not not to say that it is only hypoechoic but also in, but if you have a presence of these things or you have coexisting micro and macro calcification it makes it more sinister last but not the least do not forget the lymph nodes you have look at the nodule you look at the composition the shape the size you look at the uh, the uh, you know the the margins and you look at the you look at the uh, the echogenic foci within it but do not forget the lymph node that's why clinical examination also becomes important if you find large lymph nodes particularly cystic lymph nodes which have lost their hilum there's no hilum and there is no um, um, dedicated flow only in the hilum but a disorganized flow then you are likely to have a malignant lymph node again it's very important to cartoon your findings onto a nice little chart like this where you put a thyroid you explain where your thyroid nodule is where your lymph nodes are so it gives a good uh, you know impression to the surgeon on what they are planning to operate on now putting all these figures together the uh, acr thyroids has come up with this scoring system i told you composition echogenicity shape margins and echogenic foci and based on that you give points the more and more you do this the more and more you look at the pictures and do this the more and more good you get at it now some of these findings may be better off with a live or a, a, a video of the ultrasound rather than just a still image but whatever possible if you have a still image try to go through this acr thyroid scoring and put them into these categories based on whether it's a tr1 generally no fnac is required tr2 again generally we don't recommend fnac in tr3 fnac is required if they are more than 2 and 1/2 cm tr4 if it is more than 1 and 1/2 cm and tr5 if it is more than 1 cm so we don't fna a nodule that is even high suspicious less than 1 cm unless you have other pointers like lymph nodes or other features of distant metastasis there are certain caveats you have to keep in mind ultrasound risk stratification is geared towards excluding papillary thyroid cancer i cannot exclude a follicular pattern lesion saying whether you are follicular thyroid cancer or follicular you know uh, adenoma or if sometimes for that regard follicular variant ptc we cannot distinguish those things very easily on that so whatever features i have told you on the ultrasound gearing towards excluding ptc are very specific for papillary thyroid cancers they are not for follicular pattern lesions So a follicular pattern lesion will generally be a thyroid three or thyroid four nodule, and a Bethes dot will usually give you a Bethes dot three or a Bethes dot four. So you have to know the limitations of what ultrasound and the FNAC can give you. Patients with high risk family history again, the the sonographies have not been studied in great detail. These patients, so those with head and neck radiation, Pitten syndrome, or Cardi's complex, you have to be a little bit more careful that ultrasound features may not be. the be all the end all for these patients in these patients you may have to change your approach a little bit when you have a large a fixed nodules i think there's no point you know trying to look into ultrasound features because there you have sonograph i mean you have clinical evidence of invasion and so there you should go into more uh, techniques like a core biopsy which will give you dedicated which will give you good information rather than trying to do the ultrasound it is a caveat that isthmic nodules i don't know why have a slightly higher predilection for cancers than compared to the ones that are present in the middle low mid portion of thyroid low or the lower pole just to finish up the bethes system because you cannot really go uh, the nodule evaluation without the bethes system so the bethes system uh, categorizes the nodules into the first of one um, where it is usually non diagnostic usually you want to repeat the ultrasound guided fnac if it's a blind fnac if it's a Uh, ultrasound guided fnac then you want to repeat it again after about 2 to 3 months if it's a benign nodule generally uh, your approach is to observe repeat annual sonograms we generally follow them every 6 to 1 6 months to a year if this atypia or uh, follicular neoplasm i'll come to that in the next slide but if it is malignant then you will refer them to surgery after a proper lymph node mapping as i showed you in the last slide If you have an indeterminate nodule, whether it's a three or whether it's a four, it's always go. It's always good to go back and look at the ultrasound again, and that's an important step. If I get an FNAC of whether it's a three or whether it's a four, I go back and see my ultrasound again to see if it's truly a thyroid three or a four or a thyroid five. If it's a thyroid five nodule, I'm likely to send them for surgery. If it's a thyroid two nodule and I have a whether it's a three, I'm likely to wait. I probably will repeat an FNAC after three to six months. 
if I find a new lymph node, if I find something that I have not seen in the first ultrasound, then I am likely to take more steps to evaluate the nodule further. Ask a seasoned pathologist, a pathologist to review and talk to them. It's very important. Pathologists may not put everything that they see on the report. It's important to talk to them. They may sometimes give you some, they may tell you this Bethesda 3 is a benign Bethesda 3 or a malignant Bethesda 3. So they know that word, how to talk to a talk to pathologist and they will tell you what they have a feel about it. Karthik actually asked me this question when I presented this last time and he asked, is there a data to support this kind of sending a second opinion? And there is, in fact, a, a relatively old paper from Surgery Journal, which says that if you get a second opinion from a high volume cytopathologist, it improved the biopsy accuracy from 60 to 74% and avoided surgery in about 25%. So it is important that a good cytopathologist is reviewing your slides. Hopefully we will have molecular markers. I know the Calcutta group has worked on some very interesting markers and we will have them used in clinical settings in the future and of course knowing a high volume surgeon is always a good uh, you know, good thing to have so that you can get, you can send your patients who need surgery as well again goals of evaluation of thyroid nodules are usually to exclude cancer do not do any extra harm use common sense and most important communicate communicate with your radiologist if you're not doing the ultrasound Talk to your radiologist. Make sure that they give you the thyroid scoring. You apply the thyroid scoring for your nodules. And lastly, talk to your pathologist for, for the Bethesda system as well. I'll stop here uh, for questions. Karthik, yeah, yeah. Um, please drop your questions in the comments box. And this is a fairly uh, uh, around fifty people here. If you are okay, you can also directly ask the questions to Karthik. There's already a question in here, sir. So, how do you differentiate between uh, microcalcification and punctate echogenic force? That's, that's been already covered, I think. Uh... Punctate echogenic, yeah, punctate echogenic foci is the, the previous term that was used as microcalcifications. We don't use it anymore. We we have a little liberal uh, term as punctate echogenic foci. Because as I told you last time, the uh, the uh, the um, uh, smaller or the small comatils can sometimes mimic a microcalcification. So th that gets included in this punctate echogenic foci. So you, you get a scoring system and that for the scoring system, it, they combine these two as PEF, the punctate echogenic foci. Uh, one more question is there. Uh, is there a difference between honeycomb milk and spongiform uh, pattern? Does the pattern of calcification give a clue towards PTC molecular reference? Um, honeycombing, uh, the, the, the technical word, I think honeycombing is more of a pathological entity. But what we see in ultrasound is more of a spongy form pattern. A spongy form pattern is basically a collection of micro cysts. Um, honeycombing, um, no, I, there, there, are, there are some honeycombing appearance that you see in patients with thyroiditis, but I would completely different uh, picture, not, not connected. So I don't think you will. Find any distribution method, but spongy form is a collection of micro cysts. Now, does the pattern of calcification give a clue? Um, I told you know I, sh I showed one slide. Medullary thyroid cancers, if they have calcifications, generally tend to be large, chunky macro calcifications. The follicular thyroid cancers tend to sometimes have what we call extra you know, interrupted actual calcification. So you have interrupted actual calcifications. That is a usual clue for follicular thyroid cancers. And PTCs generally are more likely to demonstrate microcalcifications or punctate echogenic foci. So punctate echogenic foci, very classic for PTC. Interrupted rim calcifications, more classic of follicular.